Kyle Sonia here to give you my review of All Elite Wrestling's Revolution pay-per-view that just wrapped up from the Wintrust Arena in Chicago, Illinois. Um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff happened on this show. We're going to walk through match by match, starting from the buy-in to the main event. I'll run through the show, see what happened in each match, run it down, and give an overall star rating. And then at the end, we'll do the overall grade for the show. I'll also award my match of the night and my show MVP. So let's get into it. On the buy-in, we start with a tag team match between SCU, represented by Scorpio Sky and Frank and Kazarian, against the Dark Order in Evil Uno, and Stu Grayson, represented at ringside by John Silva, I think it is, and um, Alex Reynolds. Uh, before the match, we see Scorpio Sky and Frank Kazarian backstage telling Christopher Daniels sit this one out, much to his dismay. It set up like this possible tension that, you know, the whole Exalt One angle could be Christopher Daniels, but as we get into the match, that will be revealed more as we get in. So we get into the match. Um, it's pretty standard. Uh, lots, lots of back and forth starting out. There's an immediate brawl when the match starts. The bell, bell, bell just rings, and there's an immediate fight. We see an outside dive by Kaz. It later gets reversed into a powerbomb hole, and then Evil Uno takes him and throws him into the ring post. Very nice, brutal-looking spot. Uh, as the match goes on, we see a spooky perverts chant break out. Nice callback to when the group first debuted, and they were often looked at that because of the creeper aspect they had to the group. Uh, more back and forth. Dark Horse start to dominate Kazarian for a while. Kazarian was some nice spots. His usual springboard leg drop that he does off the middle rope. Some other nice spots from him and some good monkey flips I think he had. A really good combination later on we'll talk about. Against the hot tags, Scorpio Sky gets a near fall after some really nice moments. He notably does a Stu Grayson. I think Scorpio throws him off the ropes. It looks like he's going to dive onto him, but um, Scorpio Sky reverses him, hits in a nice atomic drop for a good moment there, gets a, another near fall. Later on, we see Dark Order get another upper hand. They put a, I think it was Scorpio Sky, they put in a electric chair position, and they proceed to throw him into a powerbomb with a very, ni- very, very nice weird near fall. And as we start to get some more like tension between the two, chaos in the ring starts to erupt as the creepers start getting involved. Scorpio Sky then attempts a O'Connor roll on Stu, but in the meantime, this is where it really caught me off guard. Evil Luna runs in, he takes out Sky off his forearm, and then Grayson gets the pin, and that's it. So Dark Order wins that really quickly. Um, I'm going to give the match two stars out of five. I thought it was a pretty nice match for a buy-in, but the abrupt finish caught me off guard, and there really wasn't a lot to digest. There wasn't good double-team action, but, you know, that's, it wasn't really that much else. But, you know, but we're not done there. As after the bell, Dark Order continued to attack SCU, but then we hear boom, boom, as a... Chicago native, I'd imagine, and a very nice, well-received man, Colt Cabana from the NWA and recently the New Japan Cup, which unfortunately is under the radar right now because of the recent health issues. He makes the save. He runs down, takes everybody, and even once they get the upper hand, the Dark Order's music hits. And on the ramp, we see a man in a black robe. You can't see his face at all. Is the Exalted One. They reveal themselves to be Christopher Daniels, but he is still in his SCU gear, so it proves that to be a big ruse. The baby faces stand tall, and they send them running. So, a nice feel-good moment to end the buy-in. I personally would have thought to have the reveal of the Exalted One would have been better, so you give people a reason to tune into the show. But overall, not a bad way to start the show. Could have been better, but not many complaints there. In the opening match of the main show, we start with Jake Hager, the singles debut of the MMA fighter. And against Dustin Rhodes. Dustin Rhodes with a very different look. He has a very nice face paint on. It's a very like, kind of like a Joker style face paint of his usual red and black look. Uh, interesting enough, on the buy-in, we saw JR accidentally call Jake Hager Swagger. And immediately after, uh, Shivani notably says his proper name after that. I thought it was a nice little funny moment there. And it can use JR's problem with names. Um, early on, we see it focus on Jake Hager's wife at ringside. So there's a lot of like involvement with her, as we'll get into more on that later. Um, big brawl start the match. Much like the SCU match, it really is his really physical starting up. Hager has an upper hand until Dustin gets into the outside. Eventually, they go into the crowd for a bit. Uh, they work their way like towards like the staircase, but then they eventually fight their way back. Hager gets thrown back into ringside, and they make it back. Uh, uh, later on, we see them go back to the... I think it's like the bottom, the bottom corner, like where the apron, where one of the aprons are, and we see Jake Hager hit a very stiff-looking lariat that takes down Dustin for a little bit. Both men are down. It gets like I think a seven count. They begin to get back into the ring. And then Dustin starts to fight back. He tosses him outside again. This is to the other side of the ring where his wife is. He throws Hager down. And he, then he gets over to his wife, who's yelling at him, mouthing off at him. Because the big thing that's been happening leading up is that Jake Hager's been checking on his wife, making sure she's okay and everything. So Dustin takes this and decides to kiss his wife. And that leads to a big, you sick fuck chant. And it was a very nice moment. <laughs> it's a very really good pop from the crowd. <clears throat> 
After that, Hager takes him back into the ring, does a couple lariats in the corner, and then he does a gut wrench powerbomb, his old finisher from WWE. He only gets a near fall, a very close near fall at the same time, and we keep going. Dustin then later sets up for Shattered Dreams in the corner. Hager does get out of it because there's some um, tension between Gold Dust, well, Dustin, sorry, because there's Shattered Dreams. Yeah, and they, he gets out of it, and it leads to a Canadian Destroyer for a very nice near fall. More back and forth happens, and Aubrey is eventually thrown into the corner, and listen, there's this weird spot where there's their interaction, but Hager gets the upper hand, he kicks Dustin in the balls, he's down for a bit, and then he gets him into his uh, his new submission that we've seen do a couple times on Dynamite, he gets to an arm choke, a couple shots to the body, after that, Dustin taps out, he submits, and Jake Hager has won his debut. I'm going to give this match three stars out of five. I thought it was a very nice debut for Hager. Showcases his new aggressive style, and I thought it did its job. It wasn't like the most amazing match in the world, but I thought it did its job. We had some nice moments between Dustin and Jake's wife at ringside, and I thought it was a very physical match. After that one, we have another Inner Circle member on the card. It is Sammy Guevara against Darby Allin. Obviously, this match has been built up for about a month now when Sammy took out Darby on an episode of Dynamite with his own skateboard. And the two, this one, this one's much similar. Of course, before the entrance has happened, Darby has a quick minute on the Tron talking about, well, showing like the visual early in the day of him with the skateboard in the ring. It says Sammy on it. Does a backflip, and that's the vignette. The two come out. Darby makes his entrance, and notably, as we discover in this match, Jurassic Express are in ringside as they had a promo earlier in the night talking about how they're very well, how they feel represented, have a dinosaur on pay-per-view. Very nice line from Luchasaurus, and here they are at ringside for the night. Uh, they don't get involved in this one, nor I think when we see them later, they don't do much else, but before this match starts, we see a quick suicide dive from Darby to get the match started, a very explosive start to the match. And before the, this is, of course, the bell isn't rung by this point either, so the two fight around ringside for a while, and we see a lot of different stuff happen, and then probably the biggest thing from this is that we see a Darby do a vertical suplex on a Sammy onto the barricade, Darby goes into the ring and then hits a suicide dive, but it looks like it may have went wrong. The visual that we see is that we see Darby die through the ropes like a, like a tope suicida. But, like, his head is like the only thing that makes contact with Sammy, so it was a very weird-looking spot. And it looks like it may have been a botch. We couldn't tell. He, he was okay afterwards, so that's fine. We keep going for a bit. Um, Sammy then gets a table from under the ring. Of course, kind of taking Nyla's gimmick for a bit. He sets Darby onto it, goes up to the top, and hits a very, very nice 630. I thought it was a great spot there. They eventually then finally get into the ring, and the bell rings. Sammy tries to go for the quick win, but Darby kicks out at two. And the big thing that's about this match is it's a very story about Darby coming back from the odds and really fighting his way back into the match, which was very well done. Uh, early on, we see Sammy getting the dominance, but and then Darby starts to fight back. He eventually gets Darby into a gory special, and then he slowly works into a Fujiwara armbar with a nice joint manipulation. He bends back the hand, and we see Sammy try and fight out of it. And then eventually, he turns like into a modified, I want to say like a Rings of Saturn, where he has both the arms hooked, but he doesn't really have like his, he's like over him like a normal Rings of Saturn. It looks, really, it looks really good. Sammy eventually gets, I think he gets his foot on the ropes, and so he's out of it. And there's a lot of back and forth at this point, and then they work their way into the corner. Darby tries to set up for some kind of, like, forward dive, not the coffin drop, but some other kind of dive. Uh, but then Sammy eventually catches him. He finds his way back to the top. It doesn't like the Sheldon Benjamin run-up, but he finds a hard time finding his balance. Like, his leg, like, dangles off the rope. And eventually he catches his balance, and he hits a nice Spanish fly for a very nice near fall. Later on, we see Sammy remove the turnbuckle in the corner, and then Darby notices that, so does the ref, but Darby hits a monkey flip into the exposed steel, a stun dog millionaire from Darby, and leads to the coffin drop, and Darby wins. I'm going to give this match four stars out of five. I thought it was a very explosive match. It wasn't too long, but with what they did in about, I think it was like 15 minutes, they did a very good job. All the pre-match stuff with the table wrong on the outside and the action that they showed inside the ring was a very explosive match lots of fun spots and i thought it was a very good story next up we have our first championship defense of the night it is the aew world tag team championship match between the champions kenny omega and hangman page against the young bucks matt and nick uh, this match had a very slow start the two really start feeling each other out to start it's a very back and forth fight we see some detention between pretty much all the guys in the group you know obviously the big story going to this match is how the elite will exist between all the issues that have been leading up you know of hangman leaving the elite and Kenny and Hangman win the tag belts pretty much out of nowhere, as they described. And there's a whole tension with the whole, you know, Hangman's drinking problems have been brought up. And there's also been the issue of the Bucks going after the belts, you know, Hangman talking about how, how it's funny how they won them first instead of the Bucks. It's been really taken in the heart. Um, so early stuff happens. There's a lot of back and forth, as I said. And then the most interesting thing happens early on is when Hangman takes Matt to the outside. They get to the timekeeper's area. 
by the bottom, like, by, I think it's like the bottom ringside area. But Kenny stops Matt from putting, well, Kenny stops, Hangman, I should say, that's my bad. He stops Hangman from putting Matt through the timekeeper's table, and that gets a lot of heat, and that's going to be a recurring pattern in this match, is that the crowd is very into whatever Hangman is doing, but anything that goes wrong, like, for them, and like I said, the Bucks advantage, you can see that the Bucks are clearly the heels in this match, based off like, their behavior, and how the crowd is reacting to them. <clears throat> so then for a while they get dominated in the ring there's a lot of back and forth between kenny the bucks and the can the bucks are really taking control of the match early on later on we see hayman get a hot tag into the match he's like a house of fire he hits this big cannonball sent on the mat on the outside gets back into the ring the bucks are both on the apron i think or no the bucks get bucks are back in the ring hayman gets on the apron he's able to take both guys over the top rope takes them both down and then he hits a moon on the both for a very great spot um, he, he fights them off, again, he get a near fall after that when he gets one of them back in the ring. He shoves Nick into the corner, and he demands for Matt. There's, um, a very intense stare down between the two, and there's a very scary moment here where Kenny and Hangman are doing a double team move. It's like a catch release German, but the angle that Matt lands at on his neck, it looks very scary. I hope he's okay from that. Uh, he Hangman stays in for a good while. He's in there for a good amount of time between, like, this part in the match. He doesn't really tag out. He's really trying to fight for himself, and it looks like it's going to cost him. In the corner, he gets hit with a very, like, Motor City Machine Guns type of finisher or signature move. It looked like a lot of that from the TNA days. He kicks out of it, surprisingly, because I thought that might have been it. It's kind of like, kind of like a different way of the street sweep that the LAX does, but I think they hit it the other way around. Hangman fights back into it. He eventually puts, I believe it's Matt, in the chicken wing, which is Marty Skrull's submission. So it's a nice nod to Marty there as he puts him into it. Uh, eventually, um, I think he gets he gets, he gets out of it against Twin Ropes or someone breaks it up. And after a while, Matt, eventually we see Nick get hit um, with a powerbomb into a V-trigger combo. It was a very nice move. But eventually, we all thought that might have been it, but Matt saves the day for his team. And there's a very nice moment here where we see Nick... We see Kenny and Nick. Kenny's the legal man at this point. They go into the corner, and he releases this one-winged angel corner attempt. He hits a great poison Rana. Hangman eventually tries to save Kenny, but Matt throws him out of the ring, and he hits the locomotion suplexes onto the LED, all the way from the uh, bottom of the ramp all the way up to the LED ramp because they have they have laid out. And eventually, you see, you see Matt's face. It goes back to the psychology of this match of showing like how much they Matt kind of regrets doing this to his ex, his former friends. And you can see like really like how these guys are killing it up as well because like they don't like this, but they had to show like, this aggressive side to themselves. And Kenny and Hangman are also beside themselves a lot of this match too. And it goes back to that story of like you know are they going to implode? Is someone going to turn on the other? But we'll talk more about that later. As they fight more on the ramp, we see Matt and Nick set up for an indie taker, as Excalibur called on the ramp to Hangman. The crowd do not take kind of this. They throw a lot of boos for the Bucks, unfortunately. Um, and then eventually we go back into the ring with Hangman out of commission for a bit. The Bucks are super kicking the crap out of Kenny, and they have Kenny on his knees, and then they set up for a... They set up for the golden trigger. The two of them, they, they, they sell, I think they say oh, golden lovers, and they both hit the comma go, yay, knee strike, they called the golden trigger. However, Kenny kicks out at one. It was an unbelievable moment because, you know, Kodobushi being Kenny's best friend, the whole storyline behind that, it made for a great moment. Kenny, they eventually hit more super kicks on him, but Kenny kicks out at two this time. And the Bucks, and then the Bucks eventually set for the Meltzer driver on Kenny. Hangman saves the day in a great moment. He power bombs Nick through a table at ringside. It was this weird table. It wasn't, it wasn't a timekeeper's table because that's in the play comes in the play later in the night. It was like a regular table with the AEW logo draped on top of it. So he puts Nick through that, and the Matt's left alone in the ring. We see the tag team finisher, the Buckshot Larry at V Trigger combination, but Matt kicks out at two. We all thought this might have been it for the boys at this point. So. Hangman goes back on the apron. Kenny goes for one wing and angel, but the big thing that's happened to Kenny in this match is that the Bucks have been working over his arm for a lot of it. So the psychology there is that he can't get his arm hooked to hit the, to hit the move. So to make up for this, Hangman, Kenny gets to his corner. Hangman tags in, and then Hangman hits his own one wing and angel on his own. He goes for the pinfall, but Nick says it just at the nick of time. You can't get it, but I get to see what I did there. And the match keeps going, but in a fit of rage, we see Kenny throw Nick out of the ring after this, and then... <clears throat> We see Hangman do the Buckshot Lariat to Nick. He takes him out on the ramp. He gets back at the ring, hits the Buckshot Lariat on Matt in return. One, two, three, and that's the match. The champions retain in a very long match. This is about a, this is just over 30 minutes. It was a very good match, and I'm going to give this match five stars out of five. I thought it told a great story of the whole elite angle that's been playing up for the past couple of weeks, and the tension was done really well. There was some great tag team action psychology shown by both both sides, mainly Matt Jackson alongside Kenny and Hangman. And we're not done there, too. After the match, you see the four men show respect in the ring, but there's always tension shown because you see... 
Kenny and the Bucks on one side of the ring, you see Hangman, but they all nod at each other. The Bucks walk off by themselves, and it leaves Kenny in the ring with Hangman. Kenny is in the ring, and Hangman is on the ramp, because the ramp is elevated. You can, you can walk into the ring from the ramp. He looks at Kenny. looks like he's going to tease doing a buckshot at Larry, because he puts the title down, and the crowd's ready for it. But Hangman doesn't do it. He lets Kenny through the ropes, and the two walk away into the sunset with a victory. Overall, like I said, and I thought it was a fantastic tag team match. Probably the best tag match of the year so far. And overall, just probably, and it's probably going to be one of my most reclaimed matches of the year. Next, we have our next title match. It is the AEW Women's World Championship between the champion, Nyla Rose, and her first title defense against Chris Statlander. Chris Statlander has been in an interesting position in recent weeks as she was supposed to have that one-on-one match which with Riho and Jacksonville, but obviously booking things came up so she couldn't have the match. And then there was a whole angle with the Nightmare Collective where it was a very weird spot where I thought they might have been doing a feud with them, but now that's been nixed. It leaves Statlander in a weird position. And obviously Nyla just won the belt off Riho on Dynamite a few weeks back, and now we're here. In her entrance, we see Nyla Rose mocking some very nice um, black and orange attire, and JR in commentary makes a funny joke as Taz is on commentary. He says, oh, you can make an enemy out of Taz with that orange towel. Very nice moment there from JR. Early on, we see a lot of power moves between each other. Nyla Rose hits a shoulder tackle on Chris, but she kips up, but falls over. It's unfortunate. It You know, you hate seeing stuff like that happen, but they try to pick it up. Chris Statlander attempts a spear from, I think it's from she goes into the ring. But now lose out of the way. She eats it on the ramp. And the thing about this is that they really played up what happened to Cody at full gear. Because the difference between this ramp and the one at full gear is that this one is actually covered. So Chris Stanlander's okay, thankfully. Otherwise, she probably would have cut herself really badly. But thankfully, the ramp is covered with some like kind of material. So it's all good. Two fight around the ring a little bit more. They get back into the ring. And Chris Stanlander hits two suit head outs on an alley keeper at bay at ringside into the barricade. She gets her back in the ring. She gets to the top rope, hits a shotgun dropkick for a near fall. Not too bad. Now the rope sets up for the knee drop that she likes to do um, from the top top rope onto the like top that, that she drapes the opponent on the top rope but Chris Stanlander gets into a handstand and taunts Nyla as she walks into the ring she walks into place like in front of like Nyla on the turnbuckle she taunts her she like waves her finger at her Nyla gets down but Stanlander hits an enziguri on her and then she hits she hits, she hits the boop and then a DDT for a near fall some great character work there by Chris Statlander Chris Stanlander then later then runs at Nyla Rose, but Nyla Rose counters with a beast bomb for a near fall. It was it's kind of like a pop up power bomb in a way. Like she wasn't like the proper stuff like she usually does, but it was a very quick counter. It was a very nice moment. We get to the corner, and there's some really scary moments between the two. Uh, Chris Chris is going for a superflex on Nyla, but it kind of goes awry because I think going for I think her foot gets caught and it looks more like a brain buster according to Excalibur on commentary. They eventually they eventually try to read. Looks like they're gonna redo the spot in the opposite corner of the ring, like parallel to that one. But it doesn't, but Nihilus counters it. She gets um, Chris to an avalanche beast on it. It looks like it's about to be more of a Styles Clash at first. But then she gets, picks her back up, hits an avalanche beast on it. Looks, it looks okay. And then that's it. Uh, Nyla Rose wins. I'm going to give this match two and a half stars out of five. Like, I thought the physicality between the two was good. But some of the coordination in the match could have been better. There were some sloppy moments like the finish, as I just talked about, and some other moments that just could have felt like they could have been better. And also the crowd was very, very burnt out from the previous, like, instant class that they just saw between the Elite and the Bucks. So, understandably, you know, it wasn't a bad match, but, you know, it could have been better if some of the action was just sloppy, which obviously you don't like to see, but, you know, it's a matter of, A, practicing more and also just be having that chemistry with each other. And maybe they didn't have that that night. But nonetheless, it was, was alright, but it could have been better. In your next match, it is the big match between MJF and Cody. Notably, in the entrances, MJF has a very nice robe that he comes out in, and then Cody has the man downstate plays the entering very nice moment there. Cody sporting an American Nightmare tattoo. Honestly, like, I thought this was temporary, but it looks like AEW have confirmed that it's an actual tattoo. Bit nice new, but uh, bit of nice ink, new ink there on Cody. Um, very early in the match, MJF immediately leaves the ring and cowers into the crowud. He obviously gets a lot of heat for this, and fans are taunting him at the same time as he work, as he walks back to the ring. He notably takes the fans' beer and throws it at him and yelling at him at the same time. Uh, the two eventually then fight back into the ring. Cody comes and gets MJF, and Cody gets MJF. I think it's on the ropes. He's stunned for a little bit. Cody runs all the way up the ramp to the back. Like, you can't see him anymore. He goes to the backstage area, and then he runs all the way back and hits a nice Larry to get MJF back in the ring. Nice, use of momentum there. The two fight for a little bit more. It's a lot of back and forth. Uh, eventually, on the outside of the ring, we see Wardlow trying to get into it, but Brandy has grabbed a beer at this point. She throws on the Wardlow. Cody dives into him and stomps a mud hole into him. I think that was a nice moment there. And the stuff that MJF does here throughout the match, I think it is a very good story. The big thing that MJF does is that he starts working the limbs of Cody. He works his arm for a lot of the match. 
He also applies the armbar at one point, but Cody gets out of that. He gets to the ropes, and he bites on the ropes. Says, you know, MJF is really hooking some limbs back so Cody can't get to the ropes. Later on, we see MJF take off Cody's boot. Looks like, looks like there were some nice white boots. So he, he takes off one of the boots, and then he has his foot, which is in a sock, and he bites it. A huge you sick fuck chant bat breaks out. Cody really sells it very well, uh, so it's a very good selling between both guys here. And they fight their way to the corner. Uh, Cody sets up MJF for a big reverse superplex, and it's a great sell there by MJF. He falls, he goes to the outside of the ring. Because at this point, they're very much focusing on Aaron and Brandy, who are trying to get into it with Wardlow. And when we see MJF again, he does his blade job, and he's bleeding a lot on his forehead. We could see later in the match, it looks like he bladed around his eyebrow, I think it was. And you can see all the blood onto his face. It's a very good visual. But I thought it was weirdly timed, which is like my only, like, that's like, that's like my one negative about this match. It's like the, the blading time, I thought it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Maybe I'm just not seeing things the right way. I'm just over-exaggerating. But it was a weird time, but I think the blade job did job anyway of the visual of the whole match. And eventually they fight, they fight back into the ring. Cody does a Randy Orton pose out of nowhere, and he sets up for the spike DDT, but MJF hits the Heat Seeker instead for a near fall. Outside the ring, we see Wardlow grab Randy for the F10. Cody immediately gets outside of the ring, tries to defend his wife. She puts Brandy down. He goes to big boot. Uh, Wardlow, but he eventually hits Arn Anderson instead. So not a good, not a good mixed communication there. As the ref tends to Arn Anderson, MJF hits a low blow on Cody for a near fall. Cody kicks out two five for a little bit more. They get into the corner again. There's some more tension between the ref and the competitors there. But in, in, in this, in the heat of that, Cody gets a receipt on MJF. He hits a, he hits the low blow on him, and he says it's for a vertebraker. I thought that was a very nice moment there for a near fall. <clears throat> Eventually, you see Cody loses his weight belt from all the stuff that's going on in the match. He, I thought, I thought he was gonna do all ten lashes on MJF, but he only gets two. I thought it was a nice callback to what happened with the ten lashes segment on Dynamite. He goes into the crowd, and at this point, MJF is on the ground. He grabs Cody's. I think the only booty he has on at this point. He begs for mercy. He says he's sorry to Cody. Nobody buys it. The crowd's booing at this point. So Cody, he, but then MJF spits in Cody's face. Cody doesn't take to it lightly. He hits two crossroads, but he doesn't get the. He doesn't go for the pin, which we're about to see why. It just bites him in the ass because earlier before this, you could see MJF put on the di- put on the diamond ring, which led, led to this whole thing. And after that, MJF is going to counter counters the third crossroads. He hits Cody with the diamond ring, and we get a very slow count, I thought, from the ref. But nonetheless, MJF wins with a punch from the diamond ring and the aid, and he gets the W. I'm going to give this match four stars out of five. I thought it was a very nice storytelling match. The visuals I thought were very good, and the whole angle seems to not be over yet, in my opinion. I think we're going to see more of these two, and we might get maybe like a stipulation match at Double or Nothing or on Dynamite, depending on how they want to do this. But overall, I thought it was a very good show, showing from both guys. Some really nice moments between Cody and MJF, some of the storytelling that they had going on, and the visuals that we got, and the bleeding MJF. The, the fish I thought was very sneaky and clever, because we didn't really see the diamond ring at all leading up to that. I, I thought it was very clever how they hit it. But yeah, I'm going to go with four stars for this one. I thought it was a very good match and told a great story. And I'm looking forward to see what to do next with this angle. In your semi-main event, we have the Bastard Pack going against Orange Cassidy, freshly squeezed. Notably in his entrance, Orange Cassidy is billed from wherever, and he weighs at whatever. I thought it was a very humorous entrance. And the strong, they're just that in like in hand re- in handwritten, it just says Orange Cassidy. I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, this match... I feel like if you feel like comedy wrestling and you're an Orange Cassidy fan, it's very standard to what you see. The two stand off, the bell rings, so we see super kicks. We see the two Orange Cassidy was trademark super kicks. Pac does them back, which I thought was high pop big for that. I thought that was hilarious. A lot of running the ropes between the two. Uh, we see some shoves from both guys. Pac plays with his food locks. Pac's very much dominant in the early stages of this match. He really is able to like take down Orange Cassidy super easily and just maintain control of the whole thing. Uh, we see we, we get the Orange Cassidy hope spots. He does a suicide dive outside of the ring. He does a lot of his tornado DDTs. We see him get some nice dives in Pac. So he really shows that he maybe he might do this. We get some near falls from the DDTs, and best friends do help him out at some points. There's one point I think where it's Chucky e. T throws him back into the ring. Uh, Orange Cassidy hits, hits hits a big hope spot, and eventually towards the end of the match, we see OC hit a stun dog millionaire onto Pac. I think that leads to the next part, which is where Pac crotches him on the top rope. And at the, at the same time that this happens, we see the Lucha Brothers run down, pretty surprisingly, in their, in their full gear and everything. They take off the best friends. They run to the back, which is when the crotch on top rope happens. Pac then gets Orange Cassidy on the floor. He puts him in the Brutalizer, and he needs submission, and that's the match. Um, for legit reasons, I'm going to give this match two and a half stars, but if we're going to look at it for comedy wrestling, it's a ten-star match. Like, this match, yes, this match is one that, if you like comedy wrestling, I think you'll enjoy this one a lot. 
But for looking at it from like a realistic point, I'm just gonna give it two and a half stars. Like it's it's what you expect. It's not very long either, but I thought it did its job as entertainment. Very fun comedy wrestling stuff and some great host spots there. It made you think that he maybe was going to win, but in the, we all had an idea that we knew what was going to happen in the end. But overall, very fun match, predictable result and all, but they made it worth our while. In your main event of the evening, it is now time for the AEW World Championship match. It is the champion, well, Le Champion, Chris Jericho taking on John Moxley. Moxley makes his way through the crowd, as he usually does, and then Chris Jericho has a very special entrance, uh, very much unannounced too, I believe. He has a choir singing pretty much like the first half of Judas, and then the proper song plays on the stage. It's a very nice gospel take on the song. I thought it was really well done. And Jericho comes out to the actual song. The crowd sings along. It's a great moment. And we get into the match. They go right into the crowd. Uh, Jericho attacks Moxley with, like, I think it's like one of those crowd stands like they put, like, the ropes around. He attacks Jericho. Well, he attacks Moxley with that. Sorry. And they fight around the crowd some more. They brawl back to ringside. You see Jericho we got a sign from the fan in the crowd. It's like one of those, like, it has like a reggae pattern to it. I thought it was funny like that. He gets the camera. He does the usual Jericho stuff. He does. He flips off the camera. He does all the stuff he does in, like, New Japan and WWE and all that stuff. He eventually grabs one of the barricades by ringside, hits hits um, Moxie with that. They fight their way back into the ring. And at this point, the bell has very much run, but this is a very Jericho thing to do. The two fight outside for a little bit. We see Jericho take control. He puts Moxie through the timekeeper's table. Jericho rings the bell, all those typical shenanigans that we see him do, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Jericho shows to be pretty dominant for the most part of this match. We see Moxie get some host spots. Like he, counter he counters a wall to Jericho into a knee bar, but that gets immediately to the ropes. We see another one where he reverses it, I think, into more of a... I can't remember if it was an ankle lock or something else. But he gets a reverse into that. But then the third time it happens, he gets into the proper wall to Jericho, but Moxie eventually fights out of it. And we see more tension between them. At the same time, as this um, Santana and Ortiz are at ringside for Moxley, and they obviously get involved in the match. They're obviously mouthing off at Aubrey Edwards, telling her to do her job. They get involved with Moxley a little bit. We see Ortiz use the loaded sock later in the match, too, to get, to get the advantage. More attention is shown, and there's some tension between Jericho and Aubrey later in the match, and Jericho shoves the ref. That gets a lot of heat from the crowd, obviously, for, for pretty obvious reasons. And later in the match, we see Jake Hager run down to the ring. He walks down the ramp and nails Jericho, uh, not, not Jericho, he nails Moxley by the ringside, but Aubrey sees the motion of it, like as she turns it around, and we see this great visual of the way Aubrey throws him out. She really winds it up really well, and then she ejects him. I thought it was a great moment there. However, that's not all for the shenanigans. As we see back in the ring, we see... Sammy Guevara run down for the first time since we've seen since his match and he hits Moxley with the belt. This takes a little bit to get the pinfall as Jericho goes for the pin, but Moxley kicks out at two. To be fair, the pinfall did take a little bit, so it was pretty predictable that he would kick out. So it's very much just Moxley and Jericho in the ring for a while. The two fight. Moxley's very much playing up the whole blind that he can't really like see where he is. Jericho numb nicks Moxley in his good eye. So it's hard to see. Moxley can't tell where he is. And it's a hard time seeing if he only hit ways he's going to do it. Will he lose? But eventually, we see a visual where Mox is able to get Jericho with, a regular, with the regular Dirty Deeds, not the one where he elevates them. And we see this great visual of Mox ripping off his other eye patch, well, the eye patch that he's had. And it turns out he's been completely fine. Are we shocked? Because I wasn't. But it made for this great visual because he, he was bleeding earlier in the match when he went through the table. And it's this great visual of like his blood across his eyes, and he could see again. So at this point, he gets Jericho back up, hits the Paradigm Shift, and wins the match. And we have a new AEW World Champion. I'm going to give that match three and a half stars out of five. I thought it was a very good match for storytelling reasons, but obviously it wasn't like probably the greatest match in the world. It did its job, and I really like the closing, this, the finishing sequence of Jericho of Moxley ripping off the eye patch and getting the win. And after the words, we see a good celebration from Moxley. He has a new T-shirt with the AEW Championship on it, with with Mox spray painted over it, and he cuts a very impassioned promo about how he wanted to bring pro wrestling back to the the fans that's what aw is doing and he very much um cracks at one point now he's making this off on the go oh, so talking about how aw is very unscripted and lets people go off with their promos and the show fades to black with moxie celebrating in the crowd and we see him win it's a very nice way to end the show and i thought it was a good way to end it sure maybe the match wasn't the best thing in the world but i still thought it did its job my final grade for AEW Revolution is going to be an A-. I thought the show was very strong from top to bottom. There was a lot of good stuff on this show, primarily the tag team title match, the Darby Allin Sammy Guevara match, the use of Jake Hager I thought was very effective, especially in his opening match against Dustin. Um, the Orange Cassidy Pac match is good for their own reasons. The comedy wrestling was very alive and well. I thought it was very well done. Main event was good. It had had delivered on what you expect out of these two. It had a great ending to the show. No appearance of Lance Archer, but I think they're going to say that for Dynamite this coming Wednesday. We'll see what he does there. 
and more tension of the exalted one angles play up on the buy end. So not many complaints there. The only cons I can think of are like some of the sequences in the women's title match because obviously there were some very scary sequences at the end of the match with the corner spots. And that were and maybe some of the story times of the MJF Cody match could have been better. Like man, the blade job that's very nitpicky. I still thought it was a great match. If we're going to talk about the match of the night, it's going to be the tag team match because, you know, like I said, I gave it five stars in the earlier review. And I thought it was just a very great example of tag team wrestling, the whole complete package of psychology, ring action, and furthering angles beyond the match. I thought they did a really good job of that. The show MVP, I'm going to give that to Hangman Page for his performance in the tag match and what's going to go happen, going to happen with him beyond tonight. There were a lot of good standouts from tonight's performance, other ones notably from Kenny Omega. Both Young Bucks, MJF and Cody, and John Moxley are some other notable ones that had good performances tonight. So that is the review for AEW Revolution. Hope you all enjoyed the show on your end. Next time on the channel, we're going to have a first classic pay-per-view review of Elimination Chamber 2010 brought to you by Tim. And in other regards to reviews, we'll see what we can do about the Elimination Chamber because obviously we will not be in studio for the, the event itself, but we'll see what we want to do with that. And we'll have some other stuff we'll try and get for you. But for now, I'm still from the Shoot Style Sauna. We'll see you next time.